for believing in the second coming of Christ uh, were Sunday worshipers, most of them, and as they began to understand that the coming of Christ was near, began preaching, teaching that, preaching that, uh, and, and saying to people, we're going to follow what the Bible says. A Baptist lady came up to them uh, from the Seventh-day Baptist organization, and she said, uh, you, so you're claiming to follow the Bible? Uh, then you should be keeping the Sabbath. <laughs> and um, the person, there were two people actually she spoke to at first, took that seriously, and that's how the Seventh-day Adventist organization or church ended up, uh, if you will, keeping the Sabbath. So we want to look at that some this morning and uh, try to understand uh, more about it and why. If you'll, I'd like you all to get your Bibles out. If you don't have a Bible, please take uh, one from the pew in front of you. And uh, almost all of you are familiar with this text, but turn to Genesis chapter 2. Some of you may not be able to find various books in the Bible, but Genesis is easy because it's the very first book. Of course, there's some introductory pages. So if you'll turn to Genesis chapter 2, I'd like you to watch this as I read verses, uh, well, let's just read the several verses. Uh, chapter 1, you probably know, is the record of God creating uh, everything, in, everything on this earth and the earth itself, making it livable in uh, six days. So chapter 2, verse 1, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work, which he had made, and he rested. That's the, the Hebrew word there is Shabbat. Uh, he rested uh, on the seventh day from all his work, which he had made. Now notice carefully. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work, which God created. And made. Now it's interesting that in this passage, uh, the day is not called Sabbath in the translation. Almost any scholar, you can read them from every denomination, recognizes that even though the word Sabbath isn't used in translating this from Shabbat, the Hebrew word, it's obviously referring, the scholars agree on this, that God made the seventh day of the week. Um, he blessed it. And what does it mean uh, that he sanctified it? The, mo the most common definition, you can find variations of this, he, he set it apart or he, he made it special for a holy use. That's the word sanctify. By the way, the Bible talks about God wanting to sanctify me and you. He wants to set me apart. What does it mean, set apart? Well, uh, you and I all have business that we're about all the time. Isn't that correct? I don't mean business to make money, just whatever we're doing. But uh, when you're set apart, it means besides what you normally do, there's this special thing you have been set apart for. And... Uh, that's the idea, in spite of the fact that the seventh day of the week is just another day, uh, God intended to have it be very special. Now, if you'll uh, turn with me to um, Gen Exodus 31. Um, let me give you a touch of background here. Um, the uh, Israelites, the children of Jacob, Jacob had 12 sons. Those sons became the fathers of large 
nations, which became known as the Jews or were the Jews. And um, they, uh, because they were disobedient, this is a long story made very short, God allowed uh, the Egyptians to make them slaves um, because of a famine and because one of Jacob's son, Joseph, had become, this is an incredible story, Joseph had become the ruler of Egypt, number two right behind the king, and was allowed then to invite his father, his 11 brothers, uh, because of the famine up in Palestine, actually a famine throughout that region. Uh, The king allowed uh, Joseph to invite his father and the 11 brothers and the women to come live in what today is known as the Delta uh, there in northern Africa where Egypt is, the Nile Delta, uh, which is a very fertile place because every year when the river floods, it puts soil, brand new soil, on all the land so you can grow stuff. And uh, most of you are familiar with this story, but just quickly, uh, over time, the Israelites thrived and, and became such a large nation that Pharaoh felt threatened that the Israelites were going to overrun the whole country. So he enslaved the Israelites. And for 400 years, they were slaves to the Egyptian empire. Joseph had died. The new Pharaoh didn't know Joseph, the Bible says. And um, finally, everybody knows about this, um, There was this exodus. God brought uh, Moses and his brother to lead the children of Israel, or the Israelites, or the Jewish people, to lead them uh, out of Egypt back up to Canaan, uh, where Abraham, the father, really, of all this nation, had lived. But uh, Exodus 31 uh, is, is uh, did I say Deuteronomy? I meant uh, Exodus. Okay, somehow my Bible is at uh, um, Deuteronomy, and I thought, that doesn't look right. Okay. Um, so they're, they're, they're just, they just have left Egypt. And uh, notice what it says here. Verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have called by name Bezalel, And Uri, I'm not going to take any time on that story, but this is the story of them building this tent, this traveling tent that the Bible calls the sanctuary. And it had various, it had altars and a place to wash your feet and and the ark. Most people know the story of the ark. But in verse 12, notice what uh, occurs here. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, tell the children of Israel Verily, my Sabbaths ye shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you. My Sabbaths. This is the very first place in the Bible where this idea of a Sabbath is called a sign. Um, Somebody try to think of something else that is uh, a sign for something. I'm sorry? Yeah, the rainbow, if you read the story of the flood in Genesis 6 and on, uh, at the end of the flood, uh, when they came out of the ark, there was a rainbow, and God said, this is the sign of my promise that I will never destroy the earth again with a with a flood. Something else where we use a, 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 a go ahead. And what's it a sign for? That God would, I don't know if you could hear, is this your daughter? She looks like you. My wife and I have known Jennifer for 55 years. She was Jennifer Matlack before she became Jennifer Ish. And uh, 
Where does your daughter live? Okay, very good. Your face is so familiar, but maybe it's because you look like your mother. <laughs> yeah, the altar is a sign that uh, God uh, wants to forgive me of my sins, isn't it? And whereas in the Bible times you were supposed to sacrifice an animal, now you're supposed to sacrifice your heart. Isn't that interesting? Have you ever heard anybody say, um, I gave my heart to Jesus? It's a metaphor, which means I'm willing to let Jesus control my life. Uh, we all pretty much all want that. We pretty much all don't do it sometimes. But uh, if there's a mic going, or you have the mic. Okay, go ahead, Chris. Oh, okay. He's going to speak, Bob. I'm sorry. In, in the mic. The Ten Commandments. They're, they're a sign. God wrote them with his finger. A road map for us. Yeah. All right. Um, especially for the children of Israel, but it's clear for all time. Jesus himself said, if you love me, keep my commandments. John chapter 15. So, God, God decided that he wanted uh, the Sabbath to be a sign for his people. Now notice, keep reading here. Uh, keep it for, this is verse 13 in, in chapter uh, 31 of Exodus. Uh, keep it for a sign between me and you. You know the sign I was thinking of is the sign of marriage. Now a lot of people use a ring to symbolize that. Uh, but what is the true sign of marriage. It's, it's, it's nebulous in a sense. When the pastor has the service, he turns to the young man and he says what? In short, do you take this woman to be your wife? And what does the man usually say? <laughs> I, have, I have performed many weddings. Nobody ever said, I've changed my mind. No. That usually happens later, she said. <laughs> oh, okay. And, and uh, then he turns to the woman and says the same thing. So the, the sign of the marriage is, as someone said, their stated commitment, correct? Um, so there's a lot of signs, and some of them are very meaningful, aren't they? Well, in fact, deeply meaningful. And God intended, interestingly enough, for this day of rest to be a sign for his, that, that his people are connected with him. It's a little bit like an anniversary. Isn't an anniversary a sign of the marriage commitment, for example? So forth. Um, notice that he said, through all your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord, L-O-R-D, capital. I'll not, I'll not comment on that. It has a special significance. I am the Lord that sanctifies you. So God says, look here. I want a special day in your life every week to be a sign that I am sanctifying you. I'm going to set you apart for a holy use. Very much like a marriage, if you stop and think about it. The man is to be a protector, if you will, and the woman is to, is, to, is to be part of this union where there are going to be offspring that have to be raised and so forth. So uh, this, this Sabbath uh, idea is to be a sign that God is sanctifying me. Now notice in verse 14, it gets pretty heavy pretty fast. You shall keep the Sabbath, therefore, and keeping it is something we'll look at in a minute. You shall keep it because it's holy for you. And every, now this is heavy, folks. Everyone who defiles it shall what? You're not saying it. Shall what? Be put to death? Whoa. That was pretty heavy handed, wasn't it? Um, we could spend the whole time 
trying to parse that, why God would do that. I'd rather not, uh, even though it's a very significant thing to consider. Uh, let me just suggest to you, after 400 years of slavery, the Israelite people were so bereft of an understanding of, about God and his love and the way he wants to work with you that he had to deal with them with very strict measures. Has any of you ever had a child that though they had great potential, you couldn't get their attention without very strict measures? Are you all with me on that? Um, Neva and I were holding some classes last weekend, or was it two weeks ago in State Line? Last weekend. Seems like a year ago. Um, it was a little girl. I was out getting ready for my lecture, and the ladies were fixing up some food, and this little girl was amazing. Uh, I don't know, maybe six. And uh, she wanted to quiz me. And so she had this whiteboard, my whiteboard that I'm going to draw on. She, I gave her permission. Her grandma came out and saw her drawing on the board, and she jumped all over the poor kid. And I said, it's all right. I told her she could. Anyway, she drew a series of underlines across the board, and then a hangman's noose, and uh, a circle where she, I was supposed to guess the letter, a letter from the word represented by these underlines. Are you all with me what I'm going to describe? And if I didn't guess a letter that was in the word, she put that letter in the circle so we'd know and then she drew the first part of a person, the head of, on, a, on the hangman's noose. And, and if, I, if I made enough mistakes, finally the whole man was drawn, and, and that was the end. <laughs> and this little girl, she put up some long word up there, and I would say a letter, and she would just in a moment know if that letter was in that long word or not. And either put it in its proper place, so the gals were going back and forth, and I think it was her grandma. or may, no, no, it was her teacher. Her teacher actually um, is a dear friend of ours. And I said to her, Margo, that little girl is amazing. And she said to me, yes, she has ADHD. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is, uh, the poor Israelites... Uh, there's no indication anywhere in the Bible that it was God's intention to continue using death as a punishment for not keeping the Sabbath. Are you all with me on that? There's no indication of that, but in this particular case, this shows you how serious God was about him wanting to do what they were supposed to do. Now, here's the interesting question, among many others. Today... There's only a few denominations that are, if you will, Sabbath keepers. And we won't have time today to talk about the details of keeping the day holy, but essentially, if you read here, what he said was, don't do any work. If you want to boil it down to just one thing, the Israelites were told, and that teaching is in the Bible throughout, uh, do not work, because the fourth commandment, uh, which if you'd like to turn in your Bible to Exodus 20, just a few pages back. Um, Exodus chapter 20. So they had heard about this before God says, uh, you need to do it or death will be the result. So here, here's the Ten Commandments. And let me just go to verse um, 10. I'm sorry. Verse 8, in listing the Ten Commandments, this is the one about keeping this, the seventh day of the week holy. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. You, I'm paraphrasing a bit, you or your son or your daughter or your servant, manservant or your maidservant, even your cattle or a stranger that is there within your gates. Because in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them 
and rested the seventh day, wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So that's the fourth commandment that uh, tells us that the seventh day is uh, the Sabbath. Now, there's, it's a very interesting story of how the Christian church that Jesus set up actually finally became what we call today the Roman Catholic Church. It's quite a history. And for centuries, that was the mother church. What actually happened in short, and this needs, this needs 10 hours of, of description, was that paganism got into the church via Rome and pagans were worshiping the sun. And Sunday got its name because that was the day that was set apart for sun worship. Um, and that got into the church. And when the Protestants came along and said, and I say this kindly, some of you have a Catholic background, uh, the Protestants, without exception, starting with Luther and Wesley and Knox and all these men who were the reformers, they saw that in the Catholic doctrine were many non-biblical teachings, such as, for example, purgatory, or baptizing with sprinkling instead of immersion, or even baptizing an infant when the Bible teaches that before you baptize, Jesus said, teaching them to observe all things which I have commanded you and baptized them. Remember that? So, the, actually, the list, strangely enough, folks, how this got into the church, and, and I love the Catholic people. Neva and I have a Catholic priest that, if you, if you, say to, if you went up to him and you, and you said to him, do you happen to know Jim and Neva Brackett? He would say, they saved my life. And after that happened, because he's such an influential person in that country, there was a color two-page spread in their national newspaper about the story of how we saved their li his life. Very, very interesting story. So don't misunderstand me. I have, we have dear cat. Neva and I worked one time for over a month in a country where every single person is Catholic. We learned to love those people, precious folks. But the point is, this got into the church, and when the Protestants came along and listed all of these things that had paganism that had gotten into the Roman Catholic Church that they didn't want, somehow they missed the issue of Sunday being worship instead of Sabbath. You got me on that, Sue? Very interesting story. So um, the, a question I want to raise with you this morning. Um, if you go to and I have many friends, many friends who are pastors of Sunday-keeping churches. If you go to one of them and you say, why are you keeping the first day of the week holy instead of the seventh? And by the way, I've got to stop here for a minute. Remember where I was in case I forget. Uh, Neva and I were holding meetings in Ghana, in Africa, some years ago now. And uh, I, I, of course, was going to teach, among other things, from the Bible about the Sabbath and the pastor in the town where we were holding these meetings uh, said to me, now, brother, when you start talking about the Sabbath, all of the people will understand immediately. I said, really? He said, yes, our people, uh, 10 centuries ago, were Saturday keepers. In fact, when you're born in Ghana, the, the day of the week that you're born on is your first name. So everybody in here would have one of seven first names. You'd be Monday. You could have your own middle name and your parents' last name, but your name would be Monday. And uh, it turns out that the name for Saturday is... Uh, did you... Well, I'm, I'm trying to think in English, but the name for Saturday is Kwame, which stands for Sabbath. But the name for Sunday is Kwasi, 
which means white man's day. And whenever the pastor would introduce me, he would say, the Kwasi will pray. So everybody in Ghana has one of these seven names. You, you meet them. If you, you, if you find somebody from Ghana and ask them what their first name, they may have changed it because they're you know, being accustomed to live in a different country. It'll be one of those days. But in any, in any case, in the 15th century, the Roman Catholics went to Ghana and taught them to keep Sunday. And they were white people from Europe. So uh, the name for Sunday became the white man's day, or Kwasi. You all with me on this story? So as I was teaching about the Sabbath, if you will, they just were all nodding their heads. They understand it perfectly. Very interesting. Now, where was I before I got off on that story? Ah, yes. So you go to a pastor from one of the Sunday-keeping churches, and I have many, many friends that I love dearly that are Sunday-keeping pastors. There is only really one argument and another possible, possibly connected argument uh, for them keeping Sunday. And turn with me to that text in Colossians chapter 2. And I heard last night uh, John MacArthur. I'm trying to say his last name. MacArthur. McCarthy was stuck in my mind for a second. John MacArthur, bless his heart. I love this man. I could listen to him preach forever. Uh, but he, this, this was his argument. He turned to Colossians 2, and let's just quickly read it. I'll have to get there myself if you're not there already. Help somebody, have somebody help you find it. There it is. And verse 16. Are you all there? Say yes. Let no man judge let no man therefore judge you in meat, which means food, or in drink, or in respect of an holy day, or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Notice that the word days is italicized. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll speak to that in a moment. Or of the Sabbath days, which are a shadow of things to come. But the body is of Christ. Now, I need a half an hour on this, but I'm just going to tell you what's going on here. Most of you know that when the, a word in the Bible is in italics, what we say is it is supplied by the translators. What that means is the translators could tell from the context that that word should be put there, but uh, the, uh, the, in this case, Paul, just didn't write it because it's so obvious to people who are listening. Interestingly enough, um, this, um, this, the word, so the word for day is not there, just the word Sabbath. But the context, and I'd like to take more time than this, you just have to look it up if you're interested. The context is clear that it's talking about multiple Sabbaths, even if you have a new King James. And they don't even italicize it because of the nature of the context. Pardon me? Yes, it is. Yeah. Huh? Well, yeah, Sabbaths, yeah. So the point is that, the, and, and by the way, the, the Greek word there, is sabaton, but the context, all the scholars can see this, is that it's speaking of multiple days. So it says in the New King James, Sabbaths. And uh, the idea is this. In the Greek, in the original manuscripts, I studied Greek for two years, the, the words are, the letters are all capitalized and there are no spaces between words. Amazing. Now, you get used to this. You actually could write English like that, and most of us could read it pretty well. Uh, the problem is here, the translators put a, a break. So this is what it should say. 
Sabbath days which are a shadow of things to come. Are you all with me on that? And you talk to any scholar and they will agree with this. This is referring to what we call the ceremonial Sabbaths. Most of the feasts that the Jewish people kept, and you understand feasts started on a date, so the feast didn't start on the same day of the week. You all with me on that? But most of the feasts had a Sabbath designated, a day for rest at the beginning and at the end of the feast. We call those ceremonial Sabbaths. Those are not the seventh-day Sabbaths. Are you all clear on the idea? So to use this text, bless John's heart, I love that man, a great preacher of the word, is incorrect. A shadow refers to something in connection with a sacrifice for sin. So a day which is a shadow of something to come is referring to not a seventh-day Sabbath, but a ceremonial Sabbath in the feast. Jim? Yes. What's interesting is, if you look in the, the uh, New King James, when it talks Sabbath there, it's in small letters. Every other mention 50 times in the New Testament is capitalized. Capitalized. So which, the translators understood that this was not the definite yeah. article, which was the day it was talking yeah. about ceremonial Sabbath. Yeah, thank you, Tom. So... Um, This is really their only argument. Now, the other possibility is the New Covenant. Often people will say, I'm a New Covenant Christian. I'm saved by grace. Uh, Implying that in the Old Testament, uh, people were saved by works. That's just so untrue. It it amazes me uh, that... uh, The pastors don't see that. I think God is shielding them. Uh, My experience, folks, with pastors from other denominations has been very positive. I'd love to tell you stories endlessly. I'm going to tell you one quick one. But um, the New Covenant uh, is first mentioned in Jeremiah 31. And if you go to uh, Hebrews 8, it's an exact quote from Jeremiah. The new covenant was like this. In fact, if you'll turn with me to Hebrews chapter 8, I want you to see something really quick here. If you can't find Hebrews, it's not too many pages past Colossians. And in chapter 8, notice what it says. Verse 6, I'm just going to jump into the middle. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a what? A better covenant, which was established upon better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. Now let me give you a quick background. Paul is writing about Exodus Uh, chapter 18 where God says uh, Moses comes down from the mountain he reads to the people everything God had him wrote this was before the stone was written on but there was this book full of rules and uh, God said if you'll if you'll follow this you'll be my children and what did the people say everything you said we'll do did they mean that I believe they did the Bible doesn't say one or the other but I believe they meant that Haven't you said to the Lord, I'll do it, Lord, and didn't you mean it, and didn't you fail then? Say yes. Well, if you don't say yes, I'll say yes for me. Uh, So watch this, folks. So the people made a poor promise. Even though they meant it, they, they didn't follow it through. That's what Paul is referring to when he said, uh, there at the top, my Bible at the top of the page, for finding, verse 8, For finding fault with them, this is God, says, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a a what? A new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they what? 
continued not in my covenant. That, what does that mean? They didn't do what they wanted to and promised to. Um, this is the covenant I will make with them. Now watch this point in the middle of verse 10, folks. This is incredible and incredibly critical. I will put my laws into their what? And write them in their... Let me just summarize this quickly. God says, the law that I once wrote on stone and in Moses' book, I'm going to write where? That's a metaphor. And you could, you could look at this and expand on this. That's a metaphor for saying, I'm just going to make it part of your thinking. And we speak of the heart because that's where we feel things. Is that correct? So... It's the same law, folks. There's no difference. The idea that the Ten Commandments were done away with, this is many of my pastor friends teach, the Ten Commandments were done away with, and then the, Jesus reinstated nine of them, which is an amazing thing that they can actually believe that idea. But that's what they teach. My friends teach that. So uh, the New Covenant, folks, is simply this. It's God putting it into your ownership, what he wants you to do. And even making, making it so that you want to do that. Are you all with me on this? Even if you fail. See, I see your hand, but i got to keep going because I have three minutes left. And since I'm in charge of the Sabbath school, I get after the other ones when they go over time. <clears throat> so the closing story is this. When I was a young pastor... Some of you have heard part of this story. I joined the local ministerial association in Billings, Montana. Sixty pastors. And I got to know them. At first they didn't want me to join because I was a Sabbath keeper. Um, but they let me in anyway. And by God's grace, I began to make friends with these men. And I loved those men. I learned to love those men. All of them, precious, godly, Dedicated servants. Are you all with me on this? I wish you'd have all said amen. I'm serious about that, folks. Precious men. And um, they actually ended up making me the vice president it, when at the beginning they didn't even think I should be part of the organization. It's amazing how God works. And one day, well, and I felt like my work Partly my work was to be, if you can believe this, a pastor to those men. And so I'd visit them. And one day, I stopped to visit this, this pastor who I knew was under terrific stress. I won't go into the details, just terrific stress. And um, I said, Ken, I just came by. I wanted to pray with you. We fell into conversation. And I never brought this up. It's interesting how many of them would bring it up. This is what he said to me. He said, Jim, listen. All of us, he's speaking of the 60 pastors, we all know that the seventh day is the Sabbath. Or, actually, I'm sorry, we all know that Saturday is the Sabbath. Those were his words. Isn't that amazing? Now, you might say to me, well, then why didn't you say to him, so why don't you keep it? I don't know, folks. I'm not quite there. I just felt, and I, I could be wrong, that it was better for me to just listen and let the Lord speak to them. But uh, fascinating to me um, that, uh, and, and then he said, and he said, you know what, Jim? He said, uh, I believe that when we get to heaven, we're going to keep the Sabbath. <laughs> He'd been reading Isaiah 66. From one Sabbath to another and from one new moon to another shall my people keep the Sabbath. So here's the point, folks. And most of you, of course, get all of this. And I had a bunch of other stuff for you all to read and everything, but somehow I talk too much, I guess. Um, God has a blessing, a special blessing in the work of keeping the Sabbath, which mainly is that we should stop our regular work. So Neva and I don't vacuum the house. Oh, I wanted to talk to you so much about keeping the Sabbath. Uh, let me just say this in my half minute. Keeping the Sabbath should not be about don't do this and don't do that. The marriage, where did Neva go? 
oh, over there in the light where I couldn't you see. And even the, the, you, you all know this. Our marriage is not based on don't you do this and don't you see him and don't you do... Are you all with me on that? Our marriage is based on this wonderful time we have together. Whatever we're doing. Uh, and that's... I wanted to appeal to you and have you discuss with me uh, what Sabbath keeping is like instead of it being don't do this and don't do that. It needs to be an experience, folks, that it just blossoms with this joy of a special time with God when you can lay aside all the problems of the week and just plain forget them. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your inscrutable plan. This wonderful rest physically, emotionally, spiritually, that the enemy, sadly enough, there was a time when Sunday worshipers were Sunday keepers. Lord, that has totally disappeared, virtually disappeared, because it's not scriptural. And uh, it's a sad thing when somebody misses out on this marriage-like experience of just pure joy in being together with you for a special day every week. Bless us, Lord, in that endeavor, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. There's a little break now, and we will reconvene at quarter till.